Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona, and let me add my welcome to John T. If you don't know me, my name's Pete, one of the other pastors here at Christchurch, and it's my privilege this morning to be speaking on those well-known words um, at the end of Matthew's Gospel. If you have a Bible, please keep it in front of you, and let me pray for us. Our Father, we rejoice this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, is with us, and how We need his help. We pray that you would assure us of that wonderful promise. That you'd help us to see the reality of the lordship and reign of Jesus. And that you'd help us to see how we are to live in light of it today. We ask in his name. Amen. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, memory game, I went to the market. Uh, You might know it as my grandmother went to the market. Hands up if you know that game. That's, that's, there we go. Lots of you. Um, very simple game. And yeah, actually quite a hard game. Uh, the first person says, I went to the market and I bought maybe an apple. Second person, I went to the market and I bought an apple, maybe a pear as well. Third person, I went to the market and I bought an apple, a pear, maybe a satsuma. Uh, and so on it goes. Um, each person has to go back to the beginning, remember all the previous items that were said, and then give another item. So I went to the market and I bought an apple, a pear, Satsuma, a lampshade, a guitar, a pair of roller skates, a watch, a pen knife, a lawnmower, and a burger. And in the end, it just becomes too much to remember. If you make a mistake, you're out, and the winner is the last person standing. But it strikes me uh, that in some ways, modern life can feel a little bit like a game of I went to the market. That is, it is easy to feel overwhelmed by addition. There are just so many things that we feel we should be doing or thinking or saying or remembering or having an opinion about or acting on. I wonder if you feel that. If you're a student, well, there's eating, there's sleeping, there's cooking, socializing, waking, exercising, revising, societies, there's church, there's CU, there's home, there's uni, there's friendships, there's social media, there's online, there's offline, there's parents, and there's exams. Don't forget about them. If you're a parent, well, there's work, there's cleaning, there's cooking, there's planning, there's parenting, there's school friends, there's parties, neighbours, parents, church, admin, voting, gardening, watching, screen time, homework, birthdays, and there's your children. Don't forget about them. If you're a Christian, well, there's church, there's prayer, there's the Bible, there's midweek connect or 20s, there's work, there's rest, there's sharing the gospel, there's friendships, there's tensions, there are issues you should be thinking about, there's the environment, there's theology, there's politics, there's sexual ethics, there's that must-read book, there's grief, there's giving, there's health, there's tomorrow, there's next year, and there's Jesus, don't forget about him. And it's true for us as a church as well. There are pressures to speak into this issue and that issue, this matter and that matter. There are people, there are programs There are buildings, there's money, there's the needy, there's planning, there's fundraising, there's staff, there's Sundays, there's meetings, there's newcomers, there's children, there's that new service time next week. Don't forget about that. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the many things that we should be thinking about. And we might wonder, well, if only only there was some kind of direction or focus or guidance or perspective. This is where to invest your energy. This is the one thing that really matters. This is how to live a wise life. This is what to live for. Well, this morning we turn to these last verses in Matthew's gospel, some of the last words of Jesus Christ to what is known as the Great Commission. And it's where Jesus gives his charge to the church. And he says, this is the main thing that you are to be about. 
This is the direction, the shape, the focus of the Christian life. This is the mission of the local church. And what we're going to see is at heart, it is all about being and making disciples. The call of the Christian is simply to be a faithful follower of Jesus and to help others to follow him too. Verse 16, have a look down. The 11 disciples, they go to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go, and they see Jesus. It was just as Jesus had told them how it would happen. They see him, they worship, and they doubt. That word doubt suggests hesitance. I I take it that seeing Jesus, it's just, it's almost too wonderful, too mind-blowing, too majestic think about it in front of them stands the lord of life the one they knew was hanging on a tree and there he is alive standing in front of them and he comes to them and he speaks and at this climactic moment of the gospel he explains to them the implications of his resurrection See, as christians today we need to understand not just that jesus is risen we need to understand what it means for us today, what it means for the church, what it means for the future. And so this morning we have, in the Great Commission, three implications of the resurrection. Jesus is risen, therefore this. Well, number one, therefore all authority has been given to Jesus. In 1992, the American author Michael Hart wrote a book called The 100 Most Influential People in the World. Number one, the prophet Muhammad. Number two, Isaac Newton, number three, Jesus of Nazareth. And yet what we're going to see this morning is that that is entirely misguided because Jesus Christ stands in a league of his own. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. Now Matthew began his gospel with this genealogy showing that Jesus is the long promised Messiah, the son of Abraham, the son of David, God's anointed king. The whole of the Old Testament was looking forward to this time when God's king would come. So in Psalm 2, for example, the Lord promises to install his king in Zion. And it describes in that Psalm the moment that he's crowned. The Lord says, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. In Daniel 7, as John T. read to us, Daniel pictures the Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days, receiving authority, glory, power, the worship of all nations, everlasting dominion, and a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And so the Old Testament was looking for this human figure who will be given divine authority, who will rule as king of the world. Now, just as Adam was supposed to rule and bring blessing that would spill out to the entire world also to this man will rule and the ends of the earth will experience peace and life and joy and blessing when jesus began his public ministry he proclaimed the good news that the kingdom of heaven is near that is god's king has come to bring his saving rule the night before he died The Sanhedrin before him asked him, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Now, do you remember, he answered with the most remarkable words. He said, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. In other words, though you see me now condemned, rejected, bruised, and beaten, it won't be long before you see me coming in the glory of God and reigning at God's right hand. Now for this claim, they spat at him, hit him, mocked him, flogged him, crucified him. They thought it was a joke. But now it's looking less of a joke because God raised him. Do you remember that experience um, growing up, maybe at school, where um, you were playing sport and someone was picking the teams Uh, That may for you be a a humbling memory, or maybe a proud one. But the resurrection is a bit like God picking Jesus. You are my man. It's his crowning, his coronation. Paul says in Romans 1, verse 4, Jesus was appointed son of God in power 
by his resurrection from the dead. Philippians 2, Paul says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Jesus has been raised to rule. The resurrection is his crowning, his coronation. And one day, every knee will bow. And so here, ahead of time, Matthew 28, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, obviously, before his resurrection, Jesus still had authority, but it's like this is now proclaimed and demonstrated to the whole world. That he is the Lord of life. He's the king of kings. He's the savior of the world. He's the judge of all humanity. It was uh, Abraham Kuyper, the once prime minister of Holland in the 19th century, who famously said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is Lord over all, does not exclaim mine. Every person, every Christian, every atheist, every agnostic, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, leader, politician, artist, academic, refuse collector, doctor, criminal, demon, angel, owes Jesus allegiance. He's the Lord of every nation and neighborhood and culture and community and family. And there are no exceptions. You know how some buildings have those signs on rooms which say staff only now you can't go in private no access no entry well it's not like that for jesus for him there are no out of bounds the taliban may claim that afghanistan is a muslim state but it's not it's not it belongs to jesus christ the king of the world and that is the first implication of the resurrection all authority has been given to Jesus. And it's worth pausing and noting this is the most wonderful thing. Our political system is built on the idea of limiting authority. Because although we long for strong leadership, we are wary of any individual having too much authority because we know power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Now, you and I, we have never seen authority without sin. Whether it be hypocritical politicians who say one thing and do another, abusive church leaders who use power to dominate, or violent despots who murder the innocent. So often our experience is the more authority, the more damage, but this is different. Not with Jesus, because he is the lion and the lamb. He's strong. He will cast the wicked into the lake of fire. And yet he is tender. He will not snuff out a smoldering wick. He will not break a bruised reed. And this is God's idea of rule. Courageous and caring, strong, mighty, gentle, lowly. God says, Jesus, he is my man. It's the first implication of the resurrection. All authority has been given to Jesus. Here's the second. The church has been given a mission. Verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So Jesus has authority over all, and therefore the church is called to go to all and make disciples of all. Now this was the mission for those first disciples, and you see the church in every age, because Jesus is with us doing this to the end of the age. Now, what's the basis on which we're to go and proclaim the gospel? Well, we have clearance to go to all, because as we've seen, Jesus is Lord of all. And when we call people to turn to Jesus, it might feel like we're doing something a bit odd. It might feel strange. They might think that. But actually, we're just calling people to live in light of reality. Who are the people we're called to go to? Well, all nations. Uh, Not simply nation states, but people groups. Every nation, tribe, people, 
a language. Christianity is not a Western religion, it's global. And what are we calling people to be? Well, we're to call them to be disciples. We're to make disciples. A disciple is someone who has come under the yoke and authority of Jesus Christ. To be a disciple is to bring every area of our lives under the good and wise and loving rule of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And you know, if you get given a box of chocolates in public, you might decide to share some, because that sort of feels the right thing to do, um, but also to keep a few back for later on when you're home. And that is how some people try and live the Christian life. Uh, this, yes, okay, I'll give this area of my life to Jesus, but not this area. I'll keep this for myself. But you know, that is not being a disciple. Because being a disciple is handing over the control to Jesus in every area of our lives. Jesus is not looking for converts, not simply converts. People who maybe pray a prayer, go up to the front in a Christian meeting. He wants life long followers. There are to be no no-go zones in the life of the Christian. Jesus must rule over every part of our lives, our marriages, our eating habits, our speech, our thoughts, our anxieties, our gender, our sexuality, our words, our work, our money, our relationships, our hopes, our dreams, our everything. He's looking for disciples. And those disciples are to be baptized, notice. And baptism is the picture of discipleship. It, it pictures a new life down into the water and up from the grave. It pictures a new identity, baptized into a new name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a privilege. We're part of God's family, and so we bear his name. A new start, washed by Jesus Christ, cleansed of all our wrongdoing. Disciples are to be baptized, and baptized disciples are to be lifelong learners, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Taught not just knowledge of God, but obedience to Jesus Christ. And what that means at heart, very simply, a Christian is someone who obeys the teaching of Jesus. It, Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will be obey my commands. You can't love Jesus and not obey his commands. His words determine discipleship. His words written in the Bible were for that society, first century, and therefore our society, 21st century, until the end of the age. So here is the second implication of the resurrection, the call of the Christian, the mission of the church, to make disciples of all nations. The church has been given a mission. So let me ask us four questions. Number one, are we willing to go? Jesus says go, go and make disciples. What does it mean to go? Well, maybe uh, go across the road or across the office or across the school playground or across the lecture hall and meet people a Christian will want to take initiative with people because we want to make disciples, longing and praying that people might be open to God. Maybe it means go from where you live to another part of the country, maybe a church plant, maybe a mission opportunity, maybe somewhere where there might be significant spiritual needs. Maybe it means go to the nations. Uh, Jesus wants all people from all places to be his disciples. The Bible ends with this wonderful vision of heaven. People around the throne from every nation and tribe, people and language. Not just our people, but all people. I praise God for people in this church who have a particular heart for befriending and sharing the gospel with people from other countries. Praise God because that reflects the heart of God. And this call to go is so important because so many people simply don't know. They don't know 
the Lord. Now, they've never heard of Jesus, some people. They don't know the way of salvation. They are what the Bible calls without hope, without God, longing for hope, and yet lost. As Paul says, how can they believe if they've not heard? I met one student from overseas in Precious Week who had never seen a Bible before. And there he was, standing in front of me, holding a Bible in his hands, hearing about Jesus. It's why Christians pray for and give to the work of the gospel throughout the world, because Jesus wants the nations. Are we willing to go? Likely most of us will, be, will not be called to physically go elsewhere, the countries, but, but surely some of us will be. And I wonder if that might be you. Could that be you? Are we willing to go? Second, are we willing to send? If we're not called to go, we must be willing to send. And just as going is hard, well, so too sending is hard. Do you know, it is painful to be part of a church where people go, and there's going to be a temptation to want to keep hold of them and stop them going. That's especially going to be the place in a church like ours where there's a lot of movement, but also where we have a commitment to church planting. I'm always struck by the example of the church in Antioch in Acts 13, because they have in their church for a while Paul and Barnabas, two heroes of the faith. Uh, Paul, uh, with the heart of a lion and the mind of a genius, Barnabas, that rare treasure, a faithful encourager. Now, who wouldn't want them to stay in your church? But what do the church do? Well, in obedience to the Lord, they send them away. Imagine the temptation. Maybe we should send that bloke over there <laughs> and keep Paul and Barnabas. But they don't. They send them away because Jesus says, go. Are we willing to send? Third, are we disciples? Uh, this call to make disciples will never happen unless first we are disciples ourselves. And maybe you're not a Christian here this morning. Uh, what, let me encourage you to see and to recognize that Jesus is calling you to give up everything and to follow him. Uh, Christianity is not simply information. It is a call which demands a response. Jesus has paid for our sins on the cross. He's triumphed over death by his resurrection and he calls us to come. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, rest for your souls. It's the most wonderful invitation. And if we are believers, the question is, are we growing as disciples? I saw an old friend yesterday and they told me, oh, your children have grown which is the kind of thing you say, isn't it, to someone you haven't seen for a while. But actually, that should be true of all of us spiritually. We should be growing. And the Christian is to be like a young tree, always growing. Uh, now, I know that it doesn't always feel like that. This call to grow in knowledge and obedience and love and faith and joy. Maybe it's hard to sense our own growth. It might be this morning, actually, that you are in a particular season of trial or doubt. Maybe it's something of a miracle you're even here this morning. But maybe, actually, this is God's way of growing you. Think about it. Growth is painful. But if we are alive, growth is inevitable. So are you growing? Perhaps a good question to ask is, well, what changes have I made in my life recently out of obedience to Jesus Christ. Are we disciples? Third, fourth, are we making disciples? Now, the church is to be like a family uh, with mothers and fathers, older brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins and children, people who love us and who want us to grow. God's plan is that we are in each other's lives, helping each other, to grow in the Lord. And so a, a real disciple doesn't just want to grow themselves. They're on the lookout thinking, oh, how can I encourage this person and that person to grow? Maybe it's a regular one-to-one -one meeting with a younger believer studying the Bible together. And maybe it's your children 
uh, recognizing that if they are praying for them, uh, teaching them God's word, modeling to them the life of faith. Maybe it's a struggling believer, sharing your life with them, listening to them, pointing them to the Lord. Maybe it's opening up your home, getting to know people, taking a spiritual interest in their lives. God has placed us in this church that we might help each other to grow. Are we making disciples? Second implication of the resurrection, the church has been given a mission. The world has good news to hear. So we're to be disciples, we're to make disciples. Third implication, number three, the resurrection means the presence of Jesus is with his people. One of my children uh, struggles to go into school at the beginning of the day happily. And what they need each day is mum or dad, mainly mum, to be with them on the way. And when they get to school, they need a faithful teacher, Mrs. Staggs, to meet them at the door and help them settle. And then they're fine. They just need to know they're not on their own, that someone's with them. And then they're fine. Of course, that is actually true for every Christian too. See, we Christians are being sent on a hostile mission. Jesus describes it as sheep among wolves. We are to declare the authority of Jesus Christ to sinners who want to live by their own authority. Now, we know this is wonderful news. But to them, it no, won't always feel like wonderful news news. Uh, We know also that we are weak, terribly weak, or weak in ways that sometimes we just don't really want to acknowledge. Uh, All of us will struggle in many ways. Sometimes just being a Christian is hard enough on its own, let let alone having to think about other people. And some of us will feel particularly alone, maybe very alone. And so here we have In the last words of this gospel, not another command, but a promise, a most wonderful promise and wonderful assurance. Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel began with Jesus being named Emmanuel, which means God with us. And it ends with Jesus promising to be Emmanuel, God with us with us, with us always, Uh, literally all the days, the idea of throughout all the day. There is no point ever at which the Lord Jesus is not perfectly with his people. There's a children's book called The Invisible String, um, which pictures an invisible string connecting parent to child, so that when the child's on their own, they just have to pull it and tug it, this imaginary string, and remember, oh yeah, I'm not alone. There's someone who is with me. And it's a good picture of how it is with the Lord and us, his people, because Jesus is alive and by his spirit is with us. He's with us corporately, together, and is with us individually. He's with us to guide us and comfort us to strengthen us and nudge us and convict us and teach us and testify to us and equip us. And that means we have everything we need. We're not alone. Uh, He's with us that we might know that God is for us. He loves us. He's with us that we might have the power to obey his power at work in us. He's with us that we might be equipped to serve with his strength. Do you know, Christian, you are not alone, that Jesus is with you and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. We go not forth alone against the foe. Strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender, we rest on thee and in thy name we go. It's a glorious promise the presence of Jesus is with his people and so this morning we are given in the busyness of life 
a call, a focus. We've seen three implications of the resurrection, the reality that all authority has been given to Jesus. The charge, the church, the church has been given a mission. And this glorious promise, the presence of Jesus is with his people. And so here we have something to give our lives to, a life well lived, being and making disciples. Let me pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, the Lord of life until the end of the age. Thank you for this glorious hope that we have of life beyond death, of the kingdom of God, the heavens coming to earth, the earth being filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the seas. Our Father, we pray you would help us to live in light of reality. We pray that we would live our lives as faithful followers of Jesus, would give our lives to making faithful followers of Jesus, and we would know, we would know the presence of Jesus with us all our days. We ask in his name.